Um, but it, I'm glad you bring up the USCT as sort of a, a recruiting in the valley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, how do African Americans react when military service becomes possible? Um, I mean, you mentioned that they they sometimes get employed as sort of teams that right. are as spies, but now mm -hmm. military service pr proper is available to them and units are actually seeking them as, as soldiers. Are, how are they mm -hmm. reacting to that? Yeah, so for that, that 19th USCT recruiting mission, um, there were only two recruits throughout the entire Northern Shenandoah Valley. And, and it's interesting because you, know, you, you look at that episode and then you look at how white Union soldiers reacted to this. Mm -hmm. and, and again, there was no, I mean, there's, there's still, I think, a fair amount of Union soldiers, white Union soldiers who don't want this to be a war for emancipation. Mm -hmm. and, and they see the reluctance of these individuals to enlist in the 19th USCT as you know, a, a lack of being willing to take an active role in this war and this war that's gonna destroy slavery. And I think if you look at it in that moment, you know, April of 1864, I understand why soldiers reacted as they did. But again, when you look at it in its totality, I mean, there's at least 600 African-Americans from the Valley uh, who serve in United States Color Troop Regiments. So there's, a, you know, a fair amount who enlist um, prior to April of, of 1864. And there's some who enlist after uh, that recruiting mission. But again, you know, when you're making that decision to, to enlist, it's not always, it's not always an easy one. And it just as it wasn't an easy one for an enslaved person to say, okay, I want to be free now, I'm going to leave. There's a lot of considerations that go into it. Um, so, you know, you think about that 19th USCT episode in the spring of 1864. So there are, there are pieces of evidence that say family members were hiding you know, female African Americans were hiding male African Americans because they did not want them to be taken away. Right. And it wasn't that they didn't want to take an active role, but they're thinking, well, how are white soldiers going to treat my husband, my uncle, my brother, my son, whatever the case might be? So that's that's a consideration. And then there's then there's all of those other considerations that I think every African American has to make. Um, you know, well, what happens to my family? my wife, my, my kids, when I leave and go off to war. And for some of them, one of the individuals I write about in the book, Edward Hall, who was um, enslaved in Winchester, enlisted in the 30th United States Colored Troops, he, you know, left behind his, his wife, left behind a child, and ultimately, um, you know, he fought with the 30th UCT at, at the crater, he fought at, um, you know, multiple assaults on Fort Fisher, survived the war, came back to Winchester, but he has to be thinking about, well, how does this impact my right. family? Right. Um, and then there's, there's all, also those other considerations about, well, what happens if I'm captured? Mm -hmm. Because I think African-Americans are certainly aware of Jefferson Davis's response to the Emancipation Proclamation mm -hmm. about if you are, are captured in a union uniform, you're gonna be put to death. Um, so there's all these considerations um, that, that African-Americans have to make which I think makes it all the more remarkable mm -hmm. that you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds um, making that decision to enlist um, in USCT regiments. So again, you know, I know some white union soldiers wanted to judge the, the willingness of African-Americans based on that 19th USCT recruiting mission, but the broader body of evidence just bears out that African-Americans in the Valley were committed to being again, active participants um, in this conflict. And it's, it seems very easy to judge kind of actions of people in the past to kind of say, well, they should have done that. Why, why aren't they doing it? But I think one of the aspects that you mentioned really strongly in the book and here too, is that a lot of it comes down to pragmatism of, well, if I leave, who takes care of my family? Um, mm -hmm. If I leave, what happens if I get captured, if I enlist mm -hmm. in the army? Um, how am I going to be treated? Um, and I, I think yeah. that's a really important aspect of human nature to consider. Yeah, because I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about leaving your family behind in a war zone. Right. You know, so by, by the spring of 1864, African-Americans understand the pattern in the valley 
it's back and forth and back and forth. Right. It's very, it's very different if you're a white soldier from New Hampshire. Yeah. You're, you're still going to be concerned about your, your wife and your children, but they're in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not living in a war zone. Yeah. And the, the, certainly the back and forth of like, I, I mean, how many times did Winchester change flags during the war, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you don't, numbers vary, 72, 96, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that doesn't help there to kind of like, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll protect your family. It's, you ran five times already. So why would I believe you, you're sticking right. around this time? Right. That's right. Yep. Um, 